I hope you all rested well last night and that your brain is ready to think. You got plenty of coffee. Um, yesterday, I hope I did keep it to 45 minutes, and I, I think I was under, actually. Uh, I was a little scared because Tom told me if I exceeded the 45 minutes, I'd have to preach this morning's sermon from that penalty box over there. <laughs> I think that's for COVID or for or for drummers, and I don't know which is worse, to be stuck in there or stuck in there with a drummer. <laughs> but this church does it right, they keep them in a cage. That's, that's the right place for a drummer. Anyway, since there's no threat for me tomorrow, <laughs> I don't care about being invited back. We're going to talk about the church triumphant this morning, so turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. As a former military man, I was disappointed, to say the least, with the way the Biden administration pulled American troops out of Afghanistan recently, that hurried withdrawal squandered what had been a hard-fought win. And worse, more than $80 billion in military equipment is now in Taliban hands. And especially troubling, I think for many, is the fact that the Taliban now has all of our, in, in addition to Humvees and helicopters and weapons, the Taliban now has all our bio, biometric technologies which means they have the biometric data and location data of the Afghanis who cooperated with the U.S. Intelligence assets, interpreters, people who helped in many and various ways, gunfighters, those who were fi fighting for their own country to free their women and children from a brutal Islamic regime. They're going to be hunted down like dogs. Women and children were, are going to become prey for the Taliban and spoils of war. That's how they think of them. In reflecting on that fiasco, and there are always fiascos and problems coming out of warfare, but we need to realize that that's the way the world goes. That's the way things are. That's the way our victories go. It's the nature of the triumphs that we experience in this earth. Without exception, our victories, our triumphs here on this earth are short-lived, and they often sow the seeds for the next conflict. It's just conflict after conflict after conflict. Take this woke revolution, for example this revolution in ideas in our country. Ironically, the seeds of critical theory and cultural Marxism were sown in the Allies' victory and triumph in World War II. Critical theory, cultural Marxism, social justice, and all this wokeism stuff that's going on right now, this is the mongrel offspring of hyper-liberalism, a, a Freudian psychoanalysis Cultural Marxism from the Frankfurt School in Germany blended with postmodernism from some other European radicals like Foucault and Derrida. The Frankfurt School refers to a disillusioned group of German Jewish Marxists who fled Germany, Nazi Germany, to the US during the 1930s because of the rise of Nazism. And two of those Frankfurt School men Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, they moved to Los Angeles, took up residence in Pacific Palisades, a very wealthy area in Los Angeles. They became acquainted there with artists and musicians and composers and Hollywood professionals. They mixed in with the cultural creators. Eric Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, Franz Newman, Otto Kirkheimer, they took up teaching positions on the other coast, in the, in, at Columbia University in New York, three of those men were recruited by William Wild Bill Donovan. 
He is the founder of the Office of Strategic Services, which you may know is the precursor to the CIA. Donovan clearly saw in these men, the Frankfurt School men, how their leftist critical theory of society was useful to help the Allies deconstruct German politics and then later to influence the rebuilding of Germany. He was right. Donovan was right. They were useful. Those theories were useful for deconstructing Germany during wartime. What Donovan didn't see as clearly at the time, how could he? He didn't see the unintended consequences of bringing them so close. The same ideas used to undermine and deconstruct German society have proven to be just as effective in destroying American society as well. All the West. Today we see critical theory, critical race theory, cultural Marxism, subverting and deconstructing and reshaping Western society and Western culture. Those men were dispersed. Hollywood, Columbia, the OSS in Washington, D.C. during the 1930s and 40s, and that is a wide and an early distribution of these ideas in the key cultural, educational, and political institutions of America, and those seeds bear fruit. We, here in our country, in the U.S., helped the Allies win a crucial victory, a major victory in World War II. But now we're losing another war, and it's really a more fundamental war. It's the war of ideas, the consequences of ideas. We are living with the consequences of ideas, and our society, you can feel it, I can feel it, our society is convulsing. It's like a dead body that's in the throes of death and twitching and jerking as it dies. Will our country survive this? The Lord knows. Time will tell. But back and forth we go all throughout history. In the triumphs of nations and empires, they unwittingly sow the seeds of their own demise for years later. It's inevitable, and it exposes on a grand international scale the futility of the fallen world in every sphere of life. It's the same old story. In the rise and fall of nations, it's also in the rise and fall of human beings. Will there ever be a decisive victory? Without these unintended consequences, the collateral damage of one generation that sows the seeds of the next generation's demise. Will we ever see the end of that? Will we see a final triumph, a triumph to end all triumphs? Yes, we will see that. In fact, we already have. If you are taking notes this morning, write this down. This is the first part of our triumph in Christ, which is most fundamental. Number one, in Christ, we triumph over death. In Christ, we triumph over death. We're gonna get into some uh, some issues here in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28. I want you to understand there's a lot of math behind this text. Not math, it's Greek actually, but it's, it's a lot of study and a lot of work behind the text that I have 45 minutes. I can't get into it all. So you're just gonna have to realize that there are gonna be some unanswered questions. There are gonna be some things that have come to mind that stir your thinking. That's good, write those things down, study them out later but we can't get to everything right now. This is gonna be kind of a comprehensive overview of what's in this text. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul had to defend the doctrine of the resurrection. And it may seem strange that in a church, in a Christian church whose very existence is predicated on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Paul would have to defend that doctrine that explains their existence. Then again, what might that same apostle write to some of our churches today? Where there are strange doctrinal deviations that some churches are embracing and some leaders are embracing that are just as critical and just as foolish and just as undermining to the Christian faith. So we see in Corinth, if they're gonna question even the concept of bodily resurrection, 
we should never be surprised, that we should always be on guard and watchful for doctrinal deviations entering into our churches as well. But the Corinthian church, you know the letter. I mean, that church was rife with doctrinal and practical errors. If you're ever discouraged about things going on in your church, read 1 Corinthians. You'll be greatly encouraged as you look up at your own church and say, I'm actually thankful for these errors. <laughs> but the, the letter here is corrective in nature. It may seem hard to understand how the very worst form of errors, one so patently destructive to the Christian faith, the denial of bodily resurrection, how did that one ever become a thing? It's actually not that hard to figure out with a little reflection. It was actually just another case of the culture influencing the church. Greek culture was prejudiced against bodily resurrection because of the philosophical dualism that shaped the Greek mind and Greek philosophy. Greeks believed the body made of matter, along with all flesh, along with all material reality, the stuff of the material world, they believed material matter is evil inherently. Only what is pure spirit is good. Body bad, spirit evil good. That's what they believed. That's what they brought into the church from the culture. So the idea of a bodily resurrection was not just undesirable to them, it was actually irrational nonsense. Repugnant to some, a crudity to most people. Why would anyone, having been freed from the prison of the material body, why would anyone hope their soul would return again to a body of flesh. Ludicrous. Paul says bodily resurrection, though, is a foundational tenet of our gospel. Look at the first part of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 6. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised, and he means bodily. He was raised from the dead a third day according to the scriptures. He then appeared bodily, to Cephas, to the 12, to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive. You can go and visit them if you want to, but some have fallen asleep. True biblical, doctrinally sound Christianity has never been the darling of the culture. It's never been the darling of any culture. Christians have always been out of step and out of favor with the culture since the inception of the Christian church. And we've never minded that. Christ crucified to take away our sins. If the start of the gospel is foolishness to the culture, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 1, why would we expect the end of the gospel, the telos of the gospel, to make better sense to them? So Paul confronts these resurrection deniers. He shows them in verses 12 to 19 the utter irrationality of denying bodily resurrection. You deny that principle, you deny Christ's resurrection. If you deny Christ's resurrection, all is lost. All is lost. This is all futility. We are mo all men most to be pitied. So he sums it up with this Affirmation of truth in verse 20. But now Christ has been raised. Hallelujah, right? That's where we need to start this morning. An affirmation of this rock-solid truth that Christ has been raised. That tomb is empty. He's been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Even that language of sleep is a precious euphemism for the believer. To, it's a picture of what death is like for a Christian. It's like, it's like taking a nap. Same language Paul, by the way, used back in verse 6. He, he used the same language in verse 6 and verse 20, this language of falling asleep. The 500 brothers to whom Christ appeared bodily, some of those brothers have fallen asleep. This points, I think, really what to, to what fundamentally troubled the minds of some of these Corinthian Christians. This anxiety that made them vulnerable and susceptible to the reintroduction of that Greek philosophical 
error, that prejudice against bodily resurrection to deny the principle of bodily res- resurrection. Having buried some of their loved ones who were believers, the longer their dead bodies remained in the grave, the longer they waited, the longer they wondered, the longer they looked to the skies for Christ to return just as he, just as he ascended so he would return, the more they began to wonder, hmm, maybe I've misunderstood something. Maybe, maybe the resurrection is of a different nature. Maybe it's not a bodily resurrection at all. Things that pertain to this world, this life, this matter. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's a spiritual resurrection we're talking about here. The spirit escapes the prison of the body. Maybe that's how we're to think. And so Paul, he gently but firmly answers their questions like a pastor. This is how pastors answer questions. This is how pastors deal with doctrinal challenges and doctrinal error. He does not accommodate their cultural prejudice against bodily resurrection at all. He doesn't equivocate. He doesn't shave off any offensive edges. He doesn't go to find a compromising middle of the road position affirmed by all sides. He doesn't affirm every side as having a point, having a place in the conversation. He answers their questions. He calms their anxieties by correcting their bad theology, by teaching them good theology instead. Pastors, that's what we do. We teach good theology to our people because good theology settles the heart, the mind. It puts rock under the feet It anchors the soul into truth. And people are helped with good theology. Paul says, simply put, let's let's hit the bottom line here. All Christians will take part in the bodily resurrection of the righteous. Just as Christ rose from the dead, so believers will rise from the dead. They'll follow after Christ. And it doesn't matter to God whether they die now, later, or remain alive until the Lord's return. He's got it handled. Christ triumph over death once for all, and in him we triumph too. Look at verse 20 again. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. In that section, let me show you three concepts, three big ideas that are going to increase your joy in your triumph with Christ in his resurrection. Here's a first concept. Paul pictures there are if I could put it this way, he pictures our organic union with Christ. An organic union with Christ. We are products, Christ and us, we're products of the same seed. We're harvested from the same field. And so what happened to Christ will, of course, happen to us. It's an agricultural metaphor there, the first fruits idea. It comes from Leviticus 23, where God required Israel to bring the first portion of their harvest to the Lord as an offering, worshiping in giving thanks for the blessing of his provision for their harvest. So Israel was to, in bringing that first fruits of their harvest, they would, they would, they would harvest some of that field and they would go to the temple, bring that that first fruits harvest to the Lord. They recognized in that Thanksgiving offering, they recognized the whole field belongs to God. Everything is his produce. They sowed seed God provided. They cultivated with water God provided. And they harvested a crop that God provided. And so they come offering that first fruits offering because it's the guarantee, really, of the entire rest of the harvest. That's what they're saying. Thank you, Lord, for this, which I give to you, and I walk back to to receive the promise of the rest of the harvest you've provided. This field harvest imagery is also used in the third chapter. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, 
but it's God who gave the growth. And then in verse nine, you, Corinthian church, you are God's field. You are the harvest. You are God's field. Christ is the first fruits of God's harvest. And he's gonna get the rest of the harvest too. Guaranteed. The bodily resurrection of Christians is guaranteed and it's gonna take the same pattern of Christ's bodily. So why do Christians have to die at all? That's another question that comes to their mind. Why do Christians have to die at all? And Paul answers with a second concept, the doctrine of the federal headship of Christ. He talks about our legal union with Christ. Adam and Christ stand as the representative heads of two races of humanity. So the in Adam race of humanity, of which all have participated, the in Adam race of humanity will follow its representative head, as it does, into death. The in Christ race of humanity will follow its representative head into resurrection and eternal life. Two races of humanity, each following their representative head. Christians die because they're born into this world. In Adam, death came through a man, verse 21. And in verse 22, in Adam all die. I'll have to leave you to study this one for yourself, but look at Romans chapter 5, 12 through 19 to study the doctrine of original sin, to see the imputation of Adam's sin, and all who are born of Adam are born into the same sin. He is the federal head, and all of that is transferred, imputed to all of Adam's race, all his sin, all the death comes to us as well. The corollary is also true that all who are in Christ will experience the resurrection of the dead, verse 21, and verse 22, in Christ all will be made alive. For those who are in Christ, Christ is our federal head. No longer Adam, now Christ. So whatever Christ merited in his life, merited for himself, you know what? He merits that for all whom God made him the federal head for. That is us believers, Christians. So whatever Christ is entitled to, we're entitled to. God was just to raise Christ from the dead because he never sinned. He fulfilled all of God's law, so it was just for God to raise him from the dead. We, because we're connected to Christ by imputation, we get the benefit. He merited what we get as a gift. There's an organic union with Christ. There is a legal union with Christ because of federal headship. A third thing we see here is we have a redemptive union with Christ. In Christ, all will be made alive, but there's a proper order. There's a a time of waiting for the unfolding of God's plan of redemption. So Christ, the first fruits, goes first. And he has preceded us in resurrection. And then afterward, at his coming, that's the word parousia. Parousia refers to the second coming of Christ. So afterward, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, very important word, those who belong to Christ, they too rise in a bodily resurrection. Belong to Christ. What's Paul referring to there? How do believers belong to Christ as in a possession? Well, it's by virtue of the decree of redemption. Titus 1, 2 this hope of eternal life that we have that's fulfilled in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, this is something, Titus 1, 2, that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. To whom did he promise before time began? Who was there before time began? If if it's before time began, then it's before anything was created, before God created the heavens and the earth. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created matter. Matter was put in motion. There's a measure of matter in motion. That's called time. God created time in the beginning as well, along with creating matter. Who was there before time began? God. 
in his intra-Trinitarian relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit, prior to creating heaven and earth in this timelessness, intra-Trinitarian reality, it's outside of our comprehension, but we learn in Titus 1-2 that the Father promised the Son the gift of a redeemed people, a people whom the Son then redeemed for himself and then delivered back to his Father that God might be all in all. So the resurrection is guaranteed because it's a matter of an intra-Trinitarian love, an intra-Trinitarian promise. It's sometimes called the covenant of redemption, this intra-Trinitarian love and gift-giving of this redeemed people, Father giving the redeemed people to Christ and Christ redeeming that people for himself and then giving that back to his Father. We will rise from the dead, triumphing in Christ over death because it's a matter that's way beyond us. It's beyond our pay grade. It's higher than us. It's a matter of the Father and the Son fulfilling an eternal, intra-Trinitarian decree of redemption. So much of the news that we read in these days, it's designed to make you afraid. I mean, that's how they keep you coming back to quell your anxieties that they have stirred up. So the news stirs up your anxiety, it stirs up your discontent, and you continue to digest it. And as you eat that, and it creates discontent and concern and anxiety and worry, you revisit it the next day or even in an hour to see if the story's changed. Everything is designed to make you afraid, to get you to worry, to be anxious about so many things. Christian, don't be. You don't, you can unplug. You don't have to go there. Your phone doesn't own you. You own your phone. You're invincible in Christ. Keep your head in the text and your phone unplugged or off or frankly, throw it in a lake. Just get rid of it. You're invincible in Christ over death by virtue of resurrection. And it's by virtue of three unbreakable, irrevocable realities, our organic union with Christ. And how do you know if you are organically in union with Christ? Is the same fruit growing out of your life that is evident in his? Is the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life? It's a good check to see if you're in union with him, if you have questions about that, go back to the foundation of your salvation. See if you're in legal union with Christ. See if you believe the gospel. Because it really doesn't, I mean, this matter of assurance is a difficult pastoral matter. We're always dealing with people who are questioning their salvation, questioning their, their, their assurance is troubled by particular sins or by particular weaknesses. But we always go back and we counsel people who are troubled like that, sensitive in their conscience, we always go back to the gospel itself. Because the gospel is an objective reality that doesn't depend on their shifting feelings. So go back to the gospel. And we talk about legal union with Christ. We talk about the doctrine of imputation. The imputation of our sin to Christ and in his passive obedience, what he suffered on the cross, he took away all sins through his perfect, sufficient atonement. And then we talk about the active obedience of Christ, his obedience in fulfilling all righteousness for us, for the believer. And we talk about how that is imputed then to the believer. It's God doing that from start to finish. He's the one that regenerates the sinner to new life. So that new nature, by virtue of being new, by virtue of being of God, born of the seed of the word of God, and prompted and generated by the Holy Spirit, certainly that new nature, its first breath of new life is to repent of sin and put faith in Jesus Christ. It's something God has initiated. It's something God has done. So by virtue of these three irrevocable, unbreakable realities, our organic union with Christ, talking about our present life of growth and sanctification, or our legal union with Christ, go back to the beginning and see, do I believe this objective reality of the gospel. 
And then thirdly, our redemptive union with Christ. Realize this goes back not just to the point of your salvation, this goes back before time began. We belong to him because we are part of, we are a gift from the Father to the Son. This is beyond me. This is way beyond me. Well, by those three unbreakable, irrevocable realities, we triumph in Christ over death. We triumph in Christ through this bodily resurrection. So, beloved, listen. Study your union with Christ. Until you understand these doctrines, until they all make sense, until there's a consistency flowing, anchoring your soul, study your union with Christ until you believe it deeply, until you are convicted and convinced And then tomorrow, do the same thing. Keep studying. Go deep. Colossians 3, 1 to 4, since you've been raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on what is on the earth. It's Paul's way of saying, stop checking the news. For you've died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, you also then will be revealed with him in glory. Death is the power of separation. Death is disintegration. Physical death is a separation of soul from body. It disintegrates the human person. Spiritual death is the separation of the soul from the life of God. It demolishes, spiritual death demolishes the only connection we have to the the one who is life itself. Eternal death is the permanent separation of that person from God and that person. Death, all that death, 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 death. It's all conquered for the believer in Christ. All conquered in him. John Owen put it this way in the title of his famous treatise, I love it. It's the death of death in the death of Christ. Part two of our triumph in Christ, part two. In Christ, we triumph over all powers. In Christ, we triumph over all powers. Look at verse 23 again, because there's an order to the events of the future. In Christ, all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Now, I'm gonna work out the order a little bit here. The word order, tagma, it refers to things that are ranked in the right order, ranked like military troops marching in perfect formation, lockstep together. So there's an order, and Paul tells us here about a series of events. More specifically, he's speaking about a series of of resurrections. So the first event he names here is the resurrection of Christ. He's the first fruits of the harvest. After Christ, the second event is the resurrection of all believers when Christ returns. The word parousia refers to the second coming. That's an event that's portrayed in Revelation 19, 11 to 21, the second coming and what Christ does to the armies arrayed against him. Jesus is going to return, Revelation 19, to confront that beast-led, false prophet-supported rebellion at the end of this age And when he returns, he will kill them all. He will slay them by the word of his mouth, the sword that comes out of his mouth. He will establish then his earthly reign, the millennial kingdom that is described in the very next text in Revelation 21 to 6. And at that time, as Revelation 24 to 6 says, all the saints will rise from the dead, and they will rise from the dead to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Now this hasn't happened yet, it's been almost 2,000 years separating Christ, the first fruits, from the resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the righteous. There is a time gap, obviously, in the events that Paul lists here in very short succession. But that calmed Corinthian anxieties about the lost loved ones, those who had fallen asleep in Christ and had not been raised from the dead. This provides, it should provide a great encouragement to us too to realize that time passes and the time needs to pass because God is doing his perfect wise work in the execution of the plan of redemption. Beloved, wait patiently. Don't let your waiting be 
misused. Use your waiting to serve him, to please him in your time. We, all flesh is like grass, its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. So while you are here and you are planted and you grow and you bloom, bloom for him. Flower for him. Let your life be a fragrance of Christ to the world around you because in short time, we're going to wither and die and fade away. And you know what? That ground isn't going to remember that we were even there. But the word of God abides forever. And if you are involved in the work of the word of God, you know what? All your work abides forever. Work for him. Work for him. First event, the resurrection of Christ. Second event, the resurrection of the saints of the second coming. The third event, verse 24, then comes the end. There is a lot packed in to that term, ta telos, when he delivers the kingdom of, to God the Father. So, events one and two, separated by a gap of time, followed by a third event, also are separated by a gap of time. This is the period of Christ's physical, earthly reign, called the millennial kingdom, an intermediate kingdom of the coming age, which is a prelude into the eternal state. So it's this age and then the age to come, and in the age to come, this prelude to the eternal state, called an intermediate kingdom, the millennial kingdom of Christ. And the rest of verses 24 to 28 expands upon and elaborates on those two little Greek words, ta telos, the end. What he calls ta telos will culminate in Christ delivering the kingdom up to his father. Before he's ready to do that, though, he's got some work to do. So first, verses 24 to 25, Christ will subdue every power, every opponent, every rebel force opposed to his rule. It is the triumph of all triumphs. It's the war that will end all wars. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. So he reigns on the earth, he crushes all opposition, and after that he hands the kingdom over to God the Father, and after that comes the end, the resurrection of the wicked, their appointment with God on judgment day. The word abolish is the word kaargeo, and it means to render ineffective, to cause to be useless, and in some contexts, even stronger, to wipe out, to abolish, to destroy, to bring to a full and complete end. That's what Christ will do with all rule, all authority and power that's in opposition to his. He will subdue it. He'll render it ineffective. He'll press it into submission. Any rebellious impulses will be dealt with most severely, swiftly, harshly. It'll be a ruthless destruction of any opposition force. The word rule is arche. It's a, the command of a superior over an inferior. The word authority is exousia. It emphasizes legal authority over someone. And then the word power, dunamis, talks about the ability to project that authority, to execute or exert a dominating influence and exercise rule. Those terms are often used to speak of hostile spiritual forces, demons, in many contexts, fixed in rebellion against God, but they also refer to every human rule. Every human authority and power as well, whether nations or governments or kingdoms, those who govern and rule through nations, governments, and kingdoms, so kings beware, governors beware, presidents, administrations beware, Acts 2, or uh, I should say Psalm 2. Christ will begin this subduing, this abolishing, this destroying work first when he returns to go to war against the armies of the beast that's described in Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19, as we said, when he comes and he slays them with the sword that comes from his mouth. Satan is seized at that time, Revelation 20, bound for a thousand years in order that he might be out to de deceive the nations any longer, Revelation 20, 1 to 3. And during that thousand years, Christ will sit on the throne of David. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will bring an age of unparalleled peace and prosperity here on the earth. In fulfillment of prophecies made through Solomon, Isaiah, Micah, Zechariah. I wish we had time to examine all those texts. We don't. But they are magnificent examples of God's faithfulness in the triumph of Christ over all powers. Pick up a copy sometime of Matt Wehmeyer's 
excellent book, On Millennialism and the Age to Come, if you'd like to study more on this subject. But let me just give you a few summary examples of those texts. Psalm 72 says that the Messiah will reign over the entire earth. He will glorify God by dispensing justice and compassion, justice and mercy in his reign, and by providing then an unparalleled prosperity to the earth. Isaiah 65 says that there will be long life, fruitful, bountiful harvests, blessing upon the womb, abundant peace. Even among the animals, the wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. Isaiah 11, with righteousness, the Messiah will judge the poor. He will decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked during that time. Isaiah 2, Micah 4, parallel text there. All nations, all peoples will come to the house of God. They'll come, the nations will come to learn his ways in order that they might walk in obedience, and the Lord will judge between the nations. He'll settle disputes among the peoples. Zechariah 8 says there will be peace in Jerusalem with old men and old women relaxing in the streets of the city, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets because they're safe streets. Try that now in San Francisco, Los Angeles, the major urban centers of our country. Zechariah 14, nations will go up year after year, it says, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, celebrating, get this, the Feast of Booths. All the nations of the earth, even the Gentile nations, will go up to worship the Lord of hosts, celebrating the Feast Feast of Booths. And anybody who rebels, who refuses to come, the Lord will punish them by withholding rain. This is why God tells the kings of the earth to be wise in Psalm 2. Be wise. Bow down, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you, and you die. Nations may rage now. Kings may conspire against him now. It's rather comical to the Lord in Psalm 2. God laughs at all these petty rebellions because the king he set in Zion, he's going to break him with a rod of iron. He is going to dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's not even a contest. Are you kidding me? You're going to conspire against me, against my king that I've sent in Zion, my holy mountain? They're no match for his power. What makes the earthly millennial reign of Christ necessary? Verse 25, because God promised it. He promised it, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. The declaration of the Lord to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's a promise. It's followed by this promise. Verse 2, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, from Zion, ruling over your surrounding enemies. Enemies have always surrounded Israel, always threatened. For now. But then, then the tables are turned. Then the script is flipped. It's not just the hostile earthly powers, it's hostile heavenly powers too. Revelation 20, 7 to 10, when Satan is released, he comes to deceive the nations again. He gathers them for one final battle against Christ. And you say, well, how are there nations that are going to be rebellious after that thousand year reign of Christ on the earth? And it's because there are believers who enter into the millennial kingdom in their fleshly state, in their bodily state, and they have children, and the children have long life, and the nation, after God just wipes out the unbelievers of the earth when he comes again, the earth is very quickly in a time of thousand years of peace and prosperity and righteousness ruling over the earth is going to be abundant. The womb will be blessed. These believers who enter into the millennial kingdom and have children, those children are gonna be born in the state of Adam. So they're gonna have to make a decision like we've made a decision. Will they follow Christ or will they not? It doesn't take Satan to deceive them to let the the fruit of their sinful hearts follow its path. So when Satan is released in Revelation 27 to 10, he's released, he deceives the nations again, he gathers them one more time, one final battle against Christ, and that won't end well either. Fire comes down out of heaven, It consumes them. The devil joins the beast. He takes an eternal bath in the lake of fire. It's the end for him. Then comes the end. 
the final stage in the resurrection order. Paul started in verse 23. First, Christ rises from the dead, verse 23a. Second, all believers rise from the dead, verse 23b. Third, all unbelievers will rise from the dead, which is described in Revelation 20, 11 to 15, when the sea gives up its dead, when death and Hades give up their dead, when all believing, unbelieving souls will be judged and sentence will then be executed and they'll enter into the lake of fire. Finally, at that point, Christ will put an end to death itself. It is the death that he abolished when he triumphed over it at the cross. But the last enemy to be abolished is death, for God has put everything under his feet. Why does he wait until then to abolish death? Why is death the last enemy to be destroyed? Well, death has to remain as the wages of sin. As long as there are sinners, there must be the wages of sin. There must be the payment for sin. It's for the sake, death remains to the very end for the sake of executing divine justice. This is in faithfulness to Genesis 2.17. The promise that God made to Adam, on the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. As long as sin remains, death remains. But once that tool of judgment serves no more purpose because all sinners have been judged, he'll throw it away. No longer needs it. Why is Paul bothered to give us the order of these resurrections? Why is he giving us this to the Corinthian church? Why does he give it to us? Why is it recorded in scripture for us, this order of the, this age and the age to come? Why did Christ want to reveal this to us and share with us the, the good news of his future triumph? Here are a few attempts made at constructing an answer to that. The triumph of Christ over all earthly powers reveals God's faithfulness. It shows that what he promised, he will certainly do. He promised physical, literal judgment to Israel. He also promised physical, literal restoration to Israel. It's gonna come and God is faithful. It shows God's justice that he will deal with every single sinner and every single sin. It shows God's wisdom that he will rule over the nations of the earth by his son, in his son. We'll see the righteousness and wisdom of God in action on the earth in Christ. It shows God's vindication that God blesses the meek of the earth with the earth. It shows the reward of the righteous. It shows God's demonstration, how he demonstrates the utter sinfulness of sin. The sin in the heart of people. That's the issue. You don't blame it on Satan. It's not the devil that made me do it. He'll be incarcerated for a thousand years and people will still want to sin. Beloved in Christ, we triumph over death, being united to him in his death. We're united to him in his resurrection as well. In Christ, we triumph over all powers as well. And now we come to just one final point. Again, it's a very short, very short, I trust me, short, Graham. Verse 27, God has put everything under his feet. But when he says that, he doesn't mean God, right? Makes sense. Just in case, Paul makes sure you want to Pick up what he's laying down. He says, when, when it says everything is put under him, it is obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. The Messiah is subject to God, not the other way around. So then in verse 28, once everything is subject to Christ, the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him, that is God, so that God may be all in all. And that's it. It's over. And it's also just to begun. What God planned at creation, what culminates in revelation, that's the beginning. That is the commencement of everything that God intends for his people. There is so much to do, so much to enjoy, so much of God to rejoice in and God to worship. There's so much to accomplish unhindered by sin and weakness and death. Christ came to fulfill all that in so doing to win the triumph of all triumphs. Folks, we triumph in Christ. We triumph in Christ, which is why Paul encourages us no matter what we face, no matter how strong the cultural headwinds we face, no matter how fierce the opposition, look down at the end of the chapter, verse 58, therefore, my beloved but beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor for the Lord is not in vain. Father, thank you for this wonderfully encouraging text. Thank you for your goodness to us that was planned before the foundation of the world and the eternal counsels of the, of the triune God 
we just sit back and marvel and realize what you have done for us in Christ. Oh, may we be encouraged. May we be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. May we bring glory and honor to you by the Spirit and his power in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our triumph. Amen.